Hi there. Welcome to Photo Flunky Show, episode number 83. Today we're going to be talking about pretty much all about getting started with product photography. Hi, my name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And just so you know, I'm going to put all the pressure on Lee Beam today because this is pretty much her thing. And we've been kind of looking forward to talking about this because it, it's not just product photography. This kind of thing is going to go for still life or food photography. It's kind of, I guess I, I want to go over what you've learned since you've started and, and how you've kind of developed the rhythm that you've gotten into. Because you're not the only one I know that's interested in doing this. And I've seen people on a Facebook community for business folks that are trying to do their own photography and they're having all sorts of problems with it. So I'm, I'm hoping we can make this as a bit of a resource, like how do you get started doing it? But before we get started talking about that, there is going to be a transcript of the show for free at williambeam.com slash episode 83. And you can find links to subscribe to the show there. Also, you can go to photoflunky.com. We've got a player there so you can listen to this episode, all the others that we've done. And of course we have some links there as well. I also want to let you know that on one has some free Lightroom presets. These are actually pretty cool. There's a number of them out there and I've got a shortcut from my blog for you to get there. Just go to williambeam.com slash on one LR presets. I'll have a link to this on the show notes page, but it is williambeam.com slash on one LR presets. They're very free. Absolutely <laughs> free. <laughs> They're very free. They're absolutely free. <laughs> if you've got Lightroom and you want to check out some of the presets from on one, we really encourage you to go over there and try it out. Download them, see what you think, and enjoy. If you got any questions, just let me know. Okay, let's get started with why product photography. Lee, you've been doing this for your social media and for the blog that you're starting up. What What is exactly that you're trying to do, and why, why did you need to go ahead and take your own photos and, and share them rather than, uh, I guess, using some of the product photos from... Well, it's not just companies that you're sharing. You're, you've got an ambassadorship for some of them. But you're you're also doing other things and you kind of need to show your own setup. Is that what it is? I am. And, you know, this is not I never, ever thought about doing product photography. I think it's one of the genres, certainly at a professional um, level. I would never have wanted to do it. And I still, well, at this point, I still don't. But it's something that evolved and I kind of stumbled into it through necessity and desire to do things very specifically. It's really turned out to be showing my own style. I've got a very specific way of photographing things and I think people are starting to recognize it. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you'll you'll know that I've got my kind of scrapbook background. So there is a bit of a an orderly haphazard well, method not, in my setup. Well it's not but, just the scrapbook background. Like, even before that you had an art background. I did. And, yeah. And you've got your own kind of vision of how things should look and how you arrange them. I really do. And it's something that I cannot really explain because I don't think about it as much as I I see it and I feel it. And it either balances right in, in my creative mind or it doesn't. And sometimes it's just a case of shuffling and moving things around until you're happy. You're not exactly sure what you need to do, but you know when it's not right and you kind of resonates when it is. You made a choice that you didn't need stock photography. You needed something that was specifically from you and for you. It is. And that is something that I stand for. I think what I'm with what I'm doing the essence I'm capturing in the message I'm putting across is that I am real. I have good days. I have bad days. The things that I share are things that are my own. If I ever share something of somebody else's, it will be linked and stated. So I don't want to borrow things from somebody or something else and then put them out as my own. And that, I mean, it's not always that extreme. There are times when that works very well. You know, there are products and services out there that kind of get, give people a kickstart. But I'm actually willing to have something that maybe looks a little less polished and be real about it than to put out some kind of showpiece because I want some heart and some real life in it. And your audience is reacting very well to this. In fact, you've got people asking, where are you getting your photos? They are, yeah. And then you tell them, oh, I took that. I know. And then they're even more kind of intrigued when I tell them some of them were done with my iPhone. <laughs> Well, and that's because your audience is based on endurance running. So they're not photographers. They're not photographers, no. And the idea that you're doing it, I think, is kind of surprising to some of them. That is true. But then again, I have ambassadorships. And there are also companies that I'm wanting to work with and who have got to know me, who have asked about my photos. And being on the marketing side, they are familiar with their brand. They're 
product photography and I'll give you an example this was a very naughty thing to do but I have an ambassadorship for one of the programs and they sent out the stock photo for us to to share to give a special discount code for a limited period and I looked at the photo and I thought that is just terrible so I took my own product photo and I redid the whole thing and made my, made my own and shared it <laughs> nobody ever came back in fact they liked the photo when i shared it so i'm assuming they were okay with it but well one of the nice things about doing your own photography is that you're unique and it's actually resonating with your audience on social media that's something i've read from other people who are allegedly social media experts is don't use stock photography use your own photos if you can because that's you it like i said it's unique it's you and you're not sharing the same photo that everybody else is sharing because people in a given audience probably are following a number of others that maybe with the same program for an ambassadorship or an affiliate marketing, whatever relationship is, if they see the same image everywhere, it doesn't really matter who they see. it. Well, I think that's another thing to consider. This does happen, especially when you're affiliated with some kind of company, they will send out their stock photo for whatever the promotion is or the contest or, you know, it, it could be anything. And everyone who's, part of this little group is going to be posting and sharing the same photo. The problem is that we become immune to that. So as soon as we see something that's showing up all over the place mentally, I think we're so programmed to learn how to dismiss ads and commercials and aggressive selling that we don't look at it. And I know for myself that is true. I see the same thing coming up and I just kind of disregard it and scroll through it because I know that some kind of commercial dad, if you put something different in, people are more likely to stop and at least wonder what it's about. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what you're shooting. You've got a, a couple of different styles that, that I know of. Some you get through with your run and you put up, t you take a photograph after every run. I do. And you put up a social media message for that. You've also got your food prep. Yes. And you do your food photography photos. Yes. What am I missing? I've also got some other products that I really like. I have no affiliation with these companies. I really love their products and they've become an integral part of what I do for various reasons. For example, there's um, Momentum Jewelry makes these little, um, they make little sparklets and shoe tags. These are all kind of done in, in metal and they've got a little message or a, a motivational saying or some kind of statement on them. I really love these things and I love to take photos of these things and tag them in it. I love the company. I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I'm just trying to say, I really like what you do. So those are part of it. I do have some ambassadorship programs and there are photos. I mean, one is, one is a race, an actual race ambassador. Mm -hmm. So that represents the event and that's almost seasonal from sign up time until post race when everything dies down. So I'd say about seven or eight months of the year, there are going to be things that go up there. And that gives me, it's going to be race specific or, you know, something specific to their event in the run up to the event. And then afterwards, there'll be something else um, that will come up. So, well, there are certain things that endurance runners have in common. I mean, obviously the shoes. I mean, you've, you've featured your various the shoes, shoes all for a number over of the time. place. The gels that you take when you're running and the, your food prep, we mentioned that before. But so there are products that kind of go along with this community that they recognize. And you feature those in your photographs and for social media and for your website. Yes. In order to do that, you've got to set up and do your own photography. What is it that you wish you'd known when you started? Do you know, I, I just went through all kinds of things and it, it's one of the, it sounds silly, but initially I figured if I used the big camera, the SLR, that I would get better photos. And while the photos are better quality, they didn't always capture exactly what I wanted the way I wanted. And for a long time, the easy solution was to take my iPhone, get a piece of foam board in the color that I wanted arrange my stuff outside, you know, on the lawn and, um, you know, on that foam board with daylight coming down and take the photo with the phone. I struggled. We, we don't have a lot of outside lights filtering into the home. And you know that if you switch on a light switch, you're going to get different temperatures and you start fighting with your colors. So with product photography, the color that you represent needs to be as true as possible, if not bang on to mm -hmm. um, the product that you're representing. I've kind of had to work around these little things. I use Lightroom and I'm able to do my white balance correction, which is always my first stop in, in Lightroom. And I figured that I've realized that this actually takes care of a certain amount of that. You do your best to get it right in camera, but that, that really helps. I do wish that I worried less about that and that I'd just taken a tripod 
unmount the camera on the tripod from the start because I was really trying to work this handheld. For a long time you were. Yeah. I mean, you were using both your iPhone and your DSLR on different types of shoots. Yes. So I think the ones where you're coming back from a run and you're all sweaty, you're not necessarily setting up the DSLR. Uh, that DSLR, well, it's weatherproof. It's not waterproof. After a run, <laughs> I need housing for it. Well, let's face it. It's it's more of a hassle to set that up than it is to set up the iPhone. And it's it's that's like your daily message. An iPhone works perfectly for that. It does. I mean, I'm, this is not a photography contest. This is a message. It's a communication. Since you have a better iPhone than I do, you get a better picture out of it. Well, I don't know about the front camera, but <laughs> <laughs> actually, I tried using the rear camera at the, the, the you know the, the regular camera with the two lenses. Today, I've got the iPhone Seven Plus. I have this thing set up, and I figured, okay, I'll position myself and use the you know the selfie camera or the front facing camera and then all i did was i marked the spot where i was turned the camera around and went back to it and somehow i just wasn't properly composed in there so yeah the quality was better with the one but the um, composition was better with the with the lesser quality i, I guess those probably are not so much going to be on like product photography you do it like a weekly food prep we did everything from we went to a, a produce market and we were taking photos there, you know, for the basket and you're arranging yes. things. You do your food photography, you do your setup of your uh, food prep. And then, but you, you're doing more than that. You're like even just setting up the cutting board, like here are all the ingredients that are going into this. Yeah. For example, there's so little little things that I never used to think about. I used to prep my stuff, chop it on the board and show the work in progress by taking the photo. And that, that was fine. Somehow, as I've been doing this more and more, I've realized, let me use the sort of very old weathered faithful plastic chopping board cut up the stuff and make a mess on there and i'm actually taking a spatula and sliding the stuff onto a clean nice wooden chopping board for the presentation photo and these are silly little things i wouldn't have thought about you know if you're taking your cinnamon out of the cabinet to display it as part of your image make sure the bottle is clean you know we, we cook and our hands are sticky or greasy or somebody's grabbed it you want to Get all of your things nicely clean and ready to present. Pretend that each item that you're setting out as part of your display is a model. They need to go through a quick check and an address. Well, this is something I've I've known about food photography for quite some time. The food that you eat isn't necessarily the food that you photograph, but also your presentation is everything. You're not so much selling the food that you're eating. You're selling the idea. That's exactly it, because nobody seems to like the food that I eat. Well, I don't, but <laughs> that's beside the point. But like, for example, you made, you know, your lentil soup. Yes. And you set up the board. You did all your chopping, like you said, on the old plastic one. But then you took out the nice wood block. Yes. And you set up the colors in a certain way. You arranged things around. I did. So it wasn't just a matter of your food prep, but it was also displaying the colors and the arrangement and the composition in such a way that people look at it. Even I looked at it and said, wow, that looks really good. <laughs> And, and I wouldn't eat that, you know, with a 12 foot spoon. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. <laughs> I but, thought he was laughing at me when he said it looked good. Then I realized it, it was the foot and not the feed. It really did look good. And it was the kind of thing that makes you think, wow, I want to try that. And despite the fact that there wasn't a single ingredient over there that I eat, but <laughs> it, it really did look that good. And I think that was one of the things that maybe you didn't have, like you said, when you started, you just simply showed, I'm cutting on this board. Here's a shot of what I did, yes. which was step by step. But then suddenly you graduated from, not so much from food prep, but to presentation of what you'd prepped. Yes, because I'm very involved in something that, that's going on on social media right now. And it's a, it's a live challenge. It's actually part of a, a paid training um, series that I'm doing. This is kind of a part of it. So I wanted to give a, a nice representation, not for myself as much as to kind of encourage people where it looks overwhelming in spite of the photo it was so simple this was a one pot meal and that was the message i was trying to put aside you know set across to draw people in i think you need to have something that pulls them in with color with sharpness with clarity there was all of that but you just mentioned i think what was really what you, you probably had wished you'd known when you started and, and now that you've got it is you have a message for basically these food photos are telling a story. Yes, all my photos are telling a story. That's what's making them successful, I think, is the fact that you have a message that goes with them. It's not just a matter of here I am chopping vegetables. It's like, here's what I'm trying to get to, here are the ingredients I'm going to, and you're telling a storyboard almost from this point. Maybe then you've got the other shot where you had a, the muffin pan with 
some of the ingredients inside, like pre- before you bake them and then after you bake them. Yes. And you were telling a story from, you know, beginning to middle to end. Yes, and I big- actually had a collage with the one, two, three, you know, coming down the horizontal um, photos just with the, you know, it was the preparation stage. There was in the pots and then there was the finished product. So it wasn't even so much about showing here's the food I'm eating. It's like teaching somebody here's how you can do this too. Yes. That was actually pretty cool. Now, as far as how did you kind of get, you gotten into a, a bit of a groove with this as far as you know what you need to do now. And you took like the big white V flat that we've got to use for like background fill. I did. So, yes. So what have you done to set yourself up? You're not necessarily doing a bird's eye view looking down. You're kind of looking at an angle instead. I am because I think most of us don't use a bird's eye view when we're cooking. I know that your board is kind of above you, but I almost want to give the view that you have when you're eating something, which is not straight down. You don't hover over your table to eat your food. And that's, I'm almost going for that angle. So what I will do is I will prop things up so that they lean forward to face the camera. For example, I had a, it might've been an open can of chili or something. I don't recall what it was. It was, it was hot pepper seeds. Yeah. And to get the color in there, I needed to put, I put the lid of it underneath the back end of it to tilt it so that it was facing the camera. But I really didn't want to do the bird's eye view thing because I, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the look I'm going for. I, William touched on something very important. A lot of food product photography, they've done things to the food to make it work very well in photographs, but that renders it inedible if it ever was edible in the first place. The food that I put in my photos is food that I've chopped or done something with it and I actually eat everything and anything that is on that board so I'm not putting display food out there I'm trying to make a display of what I'm actually doing and I I think that comes down to defining your purpose what is the message that you want to send across and doing it with integrity that's well integrity is something that's very important to you and we've talked about this on a number of occasions you're showing this is what who I am what I do and how I do it but it's real and that's the integrity part for you is like, not only do you have a story with it, but this isn't fake food. These are things that, you know, this is my lunch this is and my dinner. Life. Yep. This yeah. really is the story of this. This this is my daily life. This is the, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly of it. But then when it comes to the backgrounds, I think this was something else where I struggle. Like William mentioned the V flats. That was a great idea. So what I did was we have a kitchen island. We don't have a lot of outdoor light coming in through the kitchen. I was trying to avoid having to switch on the lights, the fluorescent lights or anything else. I used the tripod to slow the shutter speed, which I think was sitting at about three and a half seconds. So that gives you an idea, you know, in the middle of the day, what kind of light I was dealing with. And eventually I just flicked on a light and things, life just got so much easier. There was a little bit of white balance correction that was necessary. But there are also other little things that you need to look at. For example, I had the V flats. There's some gaffer tape or something in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got two tape together. That was fine. Uh, they were a little tall for the ceiling in the kitchen, so they were slightly leaning, which wasn't a problem. I wanted a clean white background or any you know black, white or something. I don't composite images. So it really was just going to be a background that I could blur somehow and that wasn't going to interfere with, with my subject. But the little strips of tape had to be cleaned up in Lightroom. And then there was a seam down the middle. And these were all things that I learned and every time I did it better. So what, what I did the last time is because my still lifes are relatively contained in a small area, I just took a piece of foam board and um, I had a very, very um, classy setup because I think I picked up some spice bottles and a ketchup bottle and I, <laughs> I used it behind the board to like lean it against it. And I stood that on the kitchen counter and I just made sure that I had some crop and wiggle room, you know, when I composed but that was my background and it was, you know, a quick pick it up, set it up and put it away to set up. It, it just simplified things and it it's, it's made things so much easier. I think sometimes we can complicate things when we see things that look really fancy and good. But a lot of the time, the things that you need, especially for something like this, where you're focusing on a small area, are so simple. Well, and that's one of the points I wanted to get across with this is because... Like I mentioned, I was on Facebook with some business groups and there were a number of people who were doing their own product photography and they're having all sorts of problems. People are buying these little light boxes to trying to put something in and then they, they, one, they don't get a good view of it. Two, the lighting that they're using is probably like from desktop lamps. So there's a color issue that's going on there. It's a pain to work with. 
what you're working with is very open and you're using whiteboards yeah. for reflection. You're not even using flash. I mean, I, I recommended that to you and you said, I, I'm in the middle of it right now. I don't want to... I don't want to deal with that because it's not something that you're comfortable using on a regular basis. Well, I don't, uh, it's not to say I won't or I don't like it. It's just at the time I needed to get the job done and right. I didn't want to learn something new in that moment. Although that's a case where since I'm comfortable with flash, I probably would have used it to bounce off the whiteboard. What I want to bring out is the fact that you got excellent shots without having to complicate your photos with something. You didn't need to use flash. You and just simply put up a tripod and, and let the exposure go and on longer. Shutter rele- cable shutter release, that was it, really. Yet your colors are fine. They're vibrant. People love the photos that you've got. And what I wanted to recommend is you do not need to overcomplicate this in order to get excellent results. You really don't. I mean, for example, William's got a nice, uh, he's got some really big seamless paper rolls. You've got a few different colors. You've got mm. the neutral gray. You've got the white. I think you've got a black one as yeah, well. These are available for me to use i am lazy i do not want to have to set things up but also i realize it goes beyond that i don't need to set things up and i have other responsibilities in the day as well as taking photos all day so for me time is important i'm willing to spend the time to get the right shot but i also there's a limit as to how much time i can invest in just taking one photo that's only going to serve me so much the simpler for me the better and that's really what I wanted to point out, that what works for you and I think will work for a lot of people is you do not need a complicated, big setup in order to take good product photos. You were working with our kitchen with a couple of pieces of foam board and a tripod on your camera and a cable release, and you got great photos. I did. For the food photos, I used the white. I also want to say for a lot of my product photos, some of the things have very vibrant colors you know, in their branding, and two black foam boards worked perfectly. All I did was... I- kind of laid them out at 90 degree angles. I had the base and I literally leaned it against something. It didn't have to be a perfect 90 degrees. You've got your base and you've got your background. I set the things up. I took the photo and I just kind of helped blur the background a little bit in Lightroom, you know, with a, with a brush, just going over the seams. And that was it. And every once in a while, there are some things that you'll take outside, just shoot in sunlight. And maybe you will do a bird's eye view. For example, the photograph that you've got on the header of carefreerunner.com yes. is a bird's eye view of, of your shoes and a few of your accessories, including, like I said, jewelry you were talking about. Yes, that's, that's all on there. And there are times, I mean, I've done a, a, a layout of my clothes the night before. This is a running community thing, so I won't go into it. But that was also a bird's eye view, I think, in that case. Purely because of the colors I had for the clothes I was going to wear, um, I chose a whiteboard for it. But yeah, just standing outside when I can is optimal. Food prep is a little bit more complicated outside, especially in Florida in the summer. Don't need to say any more about that. No, but I will say that I'm really proud of you for going outside and taking those photos because the place that you do it is on the side of our house where there's like a little concrete thing. And there's a snake that lives under there that every once in a while comes up and gets mad at you. I know the snake. There's, there's our resident snake um, and family, I believe. Yeah, I don't usually get bothered with the camera. I think that's my weapon of defense. If I go out with the camera, I've never been bugged. Knock so, on wood. So mind you, if you're doing your product photography outdoors in Florida, beware of snakes. I'm a tough girl. <laughs> True. Thank you very much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. Show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 83. We'll have a couple of Lee's photos out there, for example. And, of course, you can find a transcript of the show there for free. We do not have any photographs of the snake because he's a slippery little sucker. You won't get photos from me of the snake. I'm gone. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you again next week.